The year is 1346. Florence, Italy. 14-year-old Isabella collapses during morning mass, seemingly unconscious. Her parents frantically shake her limp body, but she doesn't respond. After being carried home, she sleeps for 20 hours straight, only to wake in a state of profound confusion. Who are you people? She mumbles to her own family, her eyes vacant and unfocused. When offered food, she devours everything in sight with a ravenous, almost animalistic hunger that terrifies her mother. Over the next two weeks, the once shy devout girl becomes unrecognizable, sleeping for days, then waking to gorge herself and wander the house in a daze. When awake, she speaks to invisible entities, her words slurred and nonsensical. Most disturbing of all, she begins groping herself inappropriately when others are present, exposing herself to her horrified father and propositioning the local friar with explicit language that no proper Catholic girl should know. The city elders quickly conclude that Isabella is possessed by demons. They summon Father Benedito, who performs an exorcism while the entire neighborhood watches. The girl thrashes and screams before collapsing into unconsciousness again. After two weeks, her symptoms mysteriously vanish as suddenly as they appeared. The community breathes a collective sigh of relief, praising God for casting out the evil spirits, but their relief is short-lived. Four months later, Isabella relapses into the same bizarre pattern, excessive sleep, ravenous eating, sexual promiscuity, and confused wandering. This cycle repeats every few months, convincing the townsfolk that demonic forces continue to battle for her soul. But what Isabella was actually experiencing was Klein-Levin syndrome, a rare neurological disorder causing recurrent episodes of extreme hypersomnia, cognitive disturbances, behavioral changes, and sometimes compulsive eating and hypersexuality. During episodes, patients experience a dreamlike state with confusion and hallucinations. The syndrome predominantly affects adolescents, typically beginning around age 15. Now, the exact cause remains elusive. The disorder involves dysfunction in the brain regions controlling sleep, appetite, and sexual behavior. There's no definitive cure, but the condition typically resolves itself after 8 to 12 years as episodes become less frequent. Between episodes, patients return completely to normal, something medieval exorcists would have attributed to a successful demon removal or exorcism, reinforcing their supernatural beliefs while missing the underlying medical reality. 1624, a remote Italian village nestled in the rocky Dolomites. Maria, the baker's 23-year-old daughter, lives with her husband in a humble cottage with their four-year-old child and a small black cat. Following a terrible fever, Maria begins behaving strangely. Once cheerful and mild-mannered, she's now violent and irrational, flying into uncontrollable rages and attacking her family without provocation. Her husband watches in horror as his once-loving wife stares at him with vacant eyes, muttering that invisible entities are commanding her to harm herself and others. She begins taking inexplicable risks, leaning dangerously over cliff edges while collecting herbs, walking alone at night through wolf-infested forests, and handling venomous snakes with bare hands as if invulnerable to their bite. When she thinks no one is looking, Maria snatches raw meat off of the kitchen cutting board with her filthy hands and devours it whole. Confronted, she claims the voices told her to eat it. The village priest is summoned as Maria's behavior becomes increasingly erratic. She speaks in disjointed sentences, experiences vivid hallucinations, and suffers seizures that leave her foaming at the mouth. During lucid moments, she weeps, claiming that something has invaded her mind, controlling her thoughts and actions. The local healer notes her dilated pupils and the strange rashes appearing on her skin demonic possession, the priest declares definitively, ordering her confined to a small stone room where he performs grueling exorcism rituals. The villagers whisper that a witch cursed her, or that she made a pact with the devil. How else could a pious woman transform so completely? As Maria's condition deteriorates, her husband watches helplessly while the priest sprinkles holy water on her convulsing body, convinced that only divine intervention can drive out the malevolent forces that have claimed his beloved wife. But unbeknownst to them, what was actually happening to Maria wasn't supernatural possession, but toxoplasmosis, an infection caused by the parasite Toxoplasma gondii. This microscopic organism, found in cat feces and undercooked meat, invades the human brain and alters behavior. Once inside the central nervous system, it forms cysts that disrupt neurotransmitters and rewire neural pathways. The infection causes brain inflammation, leading to personality changes, seizures, hallucinations, paranoia, and impulsivity, traits historically associated with demonic influence. Remarkable 
remarkably, Toxoplasma evolved specifically to manipulate behavior. In rodents, it eliminates the fear of cats, and in fact creates an attraction which turns them into vehicles for parasite transmission. In humans with healthy immune systems, Toxoplasmosis often causes mild or no symptoms at all. But with a compromised immune system, like Maria's after her fever, the parasite runs rampant. Research has linked Toxoplasma infection with psychiatric disorders including schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Infected individuals show increased risk-taking, aggression, and suicidal tendencies, all while unaware that they're being influenced by brain-manipulating parasites. Today, toxoplasmosis is treated with antimicrobial medication, typically pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine. Without modern treatments though, historically, victims like Maria suffered through acute infection with no relief, often developing chronic infections that permanently altered their personalities, leaving them falsely branded as witches or demon-possessed. Jerusalem, 33 CE. 14-year-old Caleb lies in agony on a straw mat. His entire body contorted into a horrifying arch. Only his head and heels touch the ground. Just days earlier, he stepped on a rusty nail. The wound, seemingly minor, was cleaned with wine and bandaged. But now, his jawbone has locked shut so tightly he can't speak or eat. His neck muscles strain like ropes, forcing his head backwards. His eyes bulge in terror as another wave of violent spasms rips through him. His spine bends impossibly backward while his limbs twist into unnatural positions. Between convulsions, he lets out guttural, inhuman growls through clenched teeth. His face contorts into what onlookers describe as a demonic grin, lips pulled back in a terrible rictus that exposes all of his teeth in a ghastly sneer. The local religious leaders have gathered at his home, watching in horror as the boy's body repeatedly seizes into rigid arches, then relaxes, only to contract again. Sweat pours from his reddened skin as he burns with fever. The rabbi grabs his arm and shouts into his ear, UNCLEAN SPIRIT! Responding to the loud noise and the touch of the rabbi, the boy's body convulses again, seeming to reinforce the idea that there's a demon inside of him, reacting violently to the Holy Presence. As night falls, the boy's pale contorted face appears to glow in the lamplight, his eyes rolling back to show only the whites, while foam bubbles from his locked jaws. Priests begin chanting prayers sprinkling sacred oil over Caleb's writhing form, and when he suddenly stops breathing and then gasps back to life, they're convinced that they're witnessing a battle between the demonic and divine forces, a battle for his immortal soul. But unbeknownst to them, the true enemy is microscopic, having entered through that simple puncture wound days earlier. Because in reality, Caleb is suffering from tetanus, often called lockjaw, a devastating infection caused by the bacterium Clostridium tetani. These bacteria thrive in soil, dust, and animal feces, and typically enter the body through wounds, especially deep punctures like Caleb's nail injury. Once inside, the bacteria produce a potent neurotoxin called tetanospasmin that travels through the bloodstream to the spinal cord and brain. This toxin blocks inhibitory transmitters, essentially removing the brakes from the nervous system and causing the muscles to contract simultaneously and uncontrollably. The characteristic arched back posture, called epistotonus, occurs because the stronger back muscles overpower the abdominal muscles. The toxin's effects typically begin in the jaw and neck before spreading downward, creating a terrifying progression of symptoms that perfectly mimic what ancient cultures believed demonic possession looked like. Modern medicine has transformed tetanus from a death sentence to a preventable disease. Today, Caleb would receive tetanus immune globulin to neutralize circulating toxin, antibiotics to kill the bacteria, muscle relaxants to control the spasms, and potentially mechanical ventilation if his breathing muscles were affected. The tetanus vaccine, typically administered as part of the DTaP or Tdap series in childhood with boosters every decade, has made this horrific disease rare in developed countries. In the United States, only about 30 cases occur annually, mainly in in unvaccinated individuals. Yet globally, tetanus still claims thousands of lives each year, particularly in regions with limited healthcare access. Now, unfortunately, for thousands of people throughout history suffering from conditions like these, the causes of their ailments 
remained mysteries. There were no known treatments or cures, and in desperation, those around them turned to religion and superstition, attempting to fill the gaps in their understanding with religious answers, often making matters drastically worse for the afflicted in the process. But while medical conditions can be scary, we don't have to add superstitious fear to the mix. The more that we learn about the human mind and body, the more that we realize that every condition previously attributed to demonic influence or witchcraft was actually the result of purely natural causes. Now this is part of an ongoing series that I've been doing to help explain exorcisms and push back against demonic superstition. If you appreciate me doing this, your support is what allows me to do it full time. So if you'd consider making a per video pledge on patreon.com slash holy kool-aid or a one-time PayPal donation, it would really mean the world to me and it would allow me to continue making content like this. Thank you so much. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.